Um, hello, everyone. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Maggie. Uh, Maggie's work is focused on improving the parameterization of marine boundary layer cloud and using machine learning and high fidelity numerical simulations to enhance our understanding of these uh, complex systems. Uh, as a DOE computational science graduate fellow, she leverages high performance computing to tackle challenges in atmospheric science. Uh, before her current re research, she uh, gained hands on experience in the climate space as a data scientist uh, at a climate tech startup and as a researcher at an environmental consulting firm. She earned her Bachelor of Arts in Earth and Planetary Science from Harvard University, where she contributed to research on Arctic methane emissions. Uh, we're very excited to have her share her research updates with us today. And with this, please join me in welcome, Maggie. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, I'm Maggie, I'm a second year PhD student in Earth and Environmental Engineering. And today I'll be talking about some ongoing work on cloud fraction parameterization uh, for shallow clouds using the Pinnacles LES. Oh, I didn't. Okay, there we go. So in today's talk, I'm going to start by providing some motivation for this work. Why do we care about shallow clouds in the context of climate change? Uh, I'll also provide some background. I know there's a diverse audience in the room. I'll tell you a bit about uh, the science of shallow clouds, the way we model them currently, and then some tools we use to understand the dynamics of these systems. I'll dig a, a bit further into the methods and talk about the machine learning architecture we'll be using. And then finally, I'll discuss our results. Um, so uh, in general circulation models, clouds are a subgrid scale process. These models have uh, horizontal resolutions on the order of 100 kilometers. Um, and um, as such, we need to parametrize, or in other words, approximate shallow clouds. Um, and so, how well we're doing uh, how well we're doing that really matters because shallow clouds cover large swaths of the global oceans, particularly in the tropics and subtropics, and thus they are playing an outsized role in the global radiative budget. Um, for those in the room who are less familiar with Earth's radiative budget, these bright clouds reflect incoming radiation back up to space. If they weren't there, that energy would be absorbed by the warm ocean surface. Um, and we still have um, persistent uncertainty in our climate projections. So considering a key summary metric, equilibrium climate sensitivity, which is the global temperature response to a doubling of CO2, um, this key metric has remained um, highly uncertain over the last decades, um, and uh, low cloud feedbacks are one of the primary uh, sources of this uncertainty. And so this work of improving how we represent shallow clouds is of high priority. Uh, so my research questions that I'll be talking about today are what is the role of subgrid scale spatial organization in predicting mean cloud fraction for shallow clouds? And how does this subgrid scale spatial organization uh, change over, or its importance change over coarsening resolution as we go from resolving more of the uh, explicit cloud processes to modeling more of those? Uh, and I'm gonna give you a bit of a spoiler at this point. Um, at this point of our research, the answers to these questions are not as exciting as you might hope, but nonetheless, I think uh, it's still a useful insight um, into how these systems work um, and how we can leverage these tools to uh, learn more about them. So um, some background. So um, we'll be talking about two types of shallow clouds today. Um, the first are stratocumulus. These are the most common type of cloud on Earth. Uh, as you can see in this figure from Wood and others in 2012, they can occur virtually uh, anywhere on Earth, 
but they're most common on the eastern boundaries of ocean basins uh, above cold uh, ocean temperatures. Uh, these clouds are driven by cloud top cooling, both radiative and evaporative. Um, and that provides energy for turbulent mixing, which is often fully coupled to the surface. Um, as you saw in that previous diagram, you might think of these stratocumulus decks as relatively continuous, but I think it's also important to understand that they're driven by up and downdraft objects. So this study by Brent and others um, used passive tracers to identify these coherent up and downdraft objects um, and confirm that this method works by finding that the updraft objects are more associated with cloudy regions, the downdrafts less so. Um, but I think the main takeaway here is although these up and downdrafts uh, contribute to a small, a relatively small portion of the domain volume, they are contributing an outsized amount to the total heat and moisture budget. Uh, so uh, these are playing an important role. The second type of cloud that I want to talk about or that we'll be looking at today are shallow cumulus clouds. So these are non-precipitating clouds. They occur often over tropical oceans or the mid-latitude land in summer. Um, and these are maybe what you would think of as your stereotypical cloud. They're flat on the bottom and have a rounded top. Um, and they have relatively short lifetimes and low cloud fractions. Uh, the figure on the right shows you first a diagram on the top and then some observations from the arm site in the Southern Great Plains. Uh, and it's just showing you a couple subtypes of uh, shallow cumulus clouds. So we have four shallow cumulus clouds, which reach the condensation level, but uh, don't reach the level of free convection. And then we can have uh, slightly uh, elongated sh shallow cumulus clouds, which do reach the level of free convection, but are ultimately capped by the upper inversion. Uh, so as I said before, um, we care about these clouds for the role that they play in uh, uncertainty and climate projections. And that's because they play an outsized role in the radiative budget. So just reiter re reiterating that stratocumulus clouds, which are these very continuous cloud decks, can therefore uh, reflect substantial amounts of incoming shortwave radiation. And so they have a cooling, a strong cooling cloud radiative effect, whereas shallow cumulus have lower cloud fraction, but they still have um, uh, a cooling uh, cloud radiative effect. Um, and so, okay, these type, both of these types of shallow clouds are quite important for the global radiative budget. How well are we doing at modeling them? So despite this importance, they suffer from significant biases. Um, and one way we understand that is that comparing our general circulation model with present day observations, we see persistent biases, um, including on their variability in short time scales. So um, what, what are we doing when we model these clouds? So um, I think the first thing to understand when you think about uh, cloud fraction, uh, when we're modeling it at a, uh, for a coarse resolution, is that fractional cloud coverage is only possible if you have subgrid scale variability in temperature and moisture. So if, the, uh, if there was no variability, then you would either have all the whole uh, region above the saturating mixing uh, ratio, a cloud cover of one, or below a cloud cover of zero. But we know that within this, you know, let's say 100 kilometer grid box, we have a lot of variability. Uh, we can have regions with or without clouds. So the way that we model this um, fall into a couple categories. Uh, the first are relative humidity schemes, like this one from Sundquist, where you model cloud fraction as a function of relative humidity, and you define a critical relative humidity. That value, again, is something less than one, so we can account for this subgrid scale variability. Um, and then you can also use statistical cloud fraction schemes. So here we want to understand the probability density function of total water, um, and we can use a variety of uh, functional forms for that. And then we define 
um, cloud cover as the portion of that PDF that is above the saturation mixing ratio. Um, but I know a lot of um, the scientists associated with LEAP in the room uh, hold the philosophy that perhaps we can improve on some of these classical modeling techniques with machine learning. So what recent work has happened in that space? So Brenda and others very recently um, used equation discovery for developing a parameterization of uh, cloud fraction. They were using an intercomparison uh, data set of global storm resolving models, Diamond, and ERA-5, which is real analysis data. Uh, interpreting these results at the bottom, this is um, what comes out of their equation discovery, the um, various features of importance um, from most to least important. And um, in some ways, um, this confirmed what we already knew. Across many of the regimes, relative humidity is one of the most important features. But there's also some surprising things. Um, for example, the change in relative humidity relative to the vertical component is an important feature across many of these regimes. Um, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, but we can look into it. Um, so, and I guess I'll, I'll also just say that this um, parameterization using equation discovery um, outperformed the Sundquist kind of classical relative humidity scheme. So we've been talking about how subgrid scale variability is important, but that's not the only information that we have or the only um, dynamic happening on the subgrid scale. There's also subgrid scale spatial organization. So for um, strata cumulus on the left and shallow cumulus on the right, we see examples of how these cloud layers organize. So first, strata cumulus like to organize into cellular structures with closed and open cell. The closed cell strata cumulus are defined by broad and relatively weak updrafts, which are topped by large cloudy regions surrounded by narrower and stronger downdrafts. Uh, oftentimes when precipitation begins, you transition into an open cell configuration where you have broad and weak downdrafts surrounded by rings of stronger uh, cloudy updrafts. And then over uh, the mid-latitude land, in particular, shallow cumulus can organize into cloud streets. This is often due to wind shear, but there can also be uh, local radiative feedbacks that can contribute to this. But we see uh, elongated updraft regions topped by clouds uh, uh, coinciding with parallel elongated downdraft regions, which are cloud free. So you might be thinking, great, we uh, care about subgrid scale information, whether it's variability or spatial organization, but how do we know anything about that? So we are using a large eddy simulation, which is a high fidelity model. It is a form of turbulence modeling where we are resolving the largest eddies, but uh, modeling the smallest one, um, which uh, gives us a good idea about the turbulent flows in these systems. And just for a bit of context for uh, those in the room, this is uh, what falls in a continuum of uh, turbulence modeling, where we go from direct numerical simulation, where all eddy sizes are uh, explicitly resolved, to Reynolds average Navier-Stokes, where all uh, eddies are modeled. OK, so with that in mind, let's talk about the objectives for this work. So we want to assess the importance of subgrid scale spatial organization in predicting cloud fraction. And we'll be using a large eddy simulation of shallow clouds. Uh, we want to learn about that subgrid scale spatial organization implicitly. So we'll be using machine learning, specifically an autoencoder, to learn that uh, and use it to um, then predict mean cloud cover. And we want to assess uh, how that uh, is important across coarsening resolution. So when we're going from uh, fine resolution and a lot of these processes are more explicitly resolved to coarser resolution, 
where we're uh, resolving less of the subgrid scale. Um, so we were using the Pinnacles Large Eddy Simulation, which is run out of Pacific Northwest National Laboratory by Colleen Call and Kyle Pressel. We looked at four domains um, where shallow clouds are common. These domains are also regions where we have uh, an abundance of observations. So um, these large eddy simulations are in part um, driven by observations. So some aircraft ca campaigns, and there's also ground measurements. So the regions we're looking at are the Northeastern Pacific, so off the coast of California. Uh, and um, these domains are dominated by stratocumulus clouds. We also looked at the Eastern North Atlantic. Uh, this is the Azores site. Uh, we also are looking at stratocumulus here and we have both summer and winter runs. For the Southern Great Plains, so this is the ARM site, um, we're looking at shallow cumulus and this is over the summertime. And then finally, we have um, more shallow cumulus over the Southern Ocean. I'll note that we are looking only at warm place clouds. We're not looking at a mix of liquid and ice hydrometers. Uh, so what does this data look like? First, the Pinnacles um, domains are 25 kilometers um, by 25 kilometers and um, roughly 50 meters. Um, we uh, merged the two grids, um, but here we're looking at cloud water. This is for a single uh, point in time for the simulation runs. And um, I guess first we can see, I think the, the biggest difference that pops out here is the difference between the stratocumulus and shallow cumulus cases. So the two Southern Great Plains, we see a more broken cloud field, lower cloud fraction, but within the cloudy regions, higher cloud water. And then within the stratocumulus cases, for example, we see some indication of closed and open cells. So for example, the Northeast Pacific, um, what we're calling Northeast Pacific two, we see these broader cloudy regions, uh, narrower cloud-free regions. Um, and whereas, for example, the Eastern North Atlantic winter one, we see um, larger uh, regions with less cloud water. Uh, and that's a precipitating case, for example. Um, the model has um, a vertical domain of 2.5 kilometers for the shallow or for the stratocumulus cases. These are lower clouds than the shallow cumulus cases. The domain for those go up to six kilometers. And I guess a couple features here that we can call out are for the shallow cumulus cases, we see highest cloud fraction at cloud base. Um, those are those flat cloud bases and then um, less cloud fraction for the, the rounder tops. For the stratocumulus cases, we see a fairly uniform cloud deck with you know, slightly decreasing cloud fraction at uh, cloud bottom. Um, and then we can see, for example, for the a lot of the open cell cases, lower cloud fraction compared to the clo closed cell cases. Um, so I've been looking at this data and we've been talking about how to interpret it. Um, another way to do that is with a data-driven approach. This uh, k-means clustering is not used in the machine learning model. It's instead used to interpret our outputs, but it is still a useful tool for understanding um, how these various cloud scenes over time are similar and dissimilar. So for those of you who are not familiar with k-means, we define a number of K clusters using centroids. A point, does def, uh, a point is part of a cluster where it is closest to that particular centroid, and we iterate to minimize the distance from points to their respective uh, centroids. And to determine the appropriate number of clusters, we're using a silhouette analysis. We're using information on the uh, 2D cloud scene, so looking at liquid water path and um, various metrics about subgrid scale uh, variability and the mean, as well as we look at the peak wavelength in liquid water path for um, looking at a liquid water path power spectrum. 
Um, so for our machine learning model, we um, you we withhold three simulations for our test set, and those are chosen fairly randomly. Although we wanted um, different domains to be represented in the test set. And as I said, we want to assess how subgrid scale variability and organization um, change in importance for prediction across coarsening resolution. So we're predicting or we're running these models at um, coarsening resolution. Um, and um, so in our pre-processing step, we coarsen and we also want to identify for a mean grid cell value, what is the uh, corresponding fine grain field. So I'll come into play in, in just a second. But so for example, if we're looking at um, cloud water, we have mean cloud water, we would also be pulling this here is actually vertical velocity, but we would be looking at that equivalent uh, subgrid scale field. Um, so to look into this, we first want to compare to some baselines. The first one is uh, a model that just has the mean values. We give it cloud water mixing ratio, vertical velocity, relative humidity. Um, and based on um, the previous equation discovery work, we're giving it also the change in relative humidity with respect to the vertical coordinate. And our prediction is for mean cloud fraction. Next, we want to uh, compare with um, a model that has some information about subgrid scale variability. So um, for that equivalent fine, uh, fine resolution field, we compute the variance and skewness for um, our variable of interest. We'll be looking at cloud water and vertical velocity, and we give that as an additional input to the neural network. Um, so it has the same uh, mean inputs as before. Um, and then before I go into the final architecture, I want to just briefly um, introduce um, an autoencoder. So I'm, I'm sure many in the room are familiar, but for those who are not, this is a data compression technique. In this case, we'll be using a convolutional autoencoder. So we start with a 2D field of interest. We use um, a sequence of convolutional layers to compress the data to a latent space Z. Um, and then we um, re do the reverse. We use convolutional layers to expand it out to a reproduced field um, X hat. Um, so the final architecture, now we're trying to assess the role of subgrid scale spatial organization. So um, instead of using this fine green field to produce variance and skewness. Instead, we put it through an autoencoder to reproduce the field. Um, and so I'll talk a bit about the loss function. So this loss function um, includes mean squared error for cloud fraction. Uh, it includes a term for our reconstruction of the fine grained field, whether that's cloud water or vertical velocity. And then finally, we want this model to be rotation invariant. So for this input field, we uh, train two auto, uh, tra sorry, train two encoders, one for the correctly oriented field and one that has been randomly rotated and number of uh, 90 degrees rotations. Um, and we want the latent space representation of those two fields to be close together. That's that final term. And our lambdas here are hyperparameters, basically the balance of each of these terms in our loss function, how important is it to the, the neural network? And those are hyperparameters that we tuned. Um, I wanted to um, show you what our test sets look like. So for the Northeast Pacific, we have high cloud fraction. Um, we're looking at a, a slice in Z of cloud, uh, uh, cloud water. Uh, and we can see broad cloudy regions. For the East North Atlantic winter one, um, we see uh, lower cloud fraction. This would be um, what we're interpreting as an open cell case. And then the Southern Great Plains is um, the shallow cumulus. And we can see with this horizontal slice, um, sorry, this vertical slice that the uh, shallow cumulus fields are to be expected higher 
and deeper than the stratocumulus fields. Um, and just to show you now here, these are the two fields that we'll be using in our um, autoencoder and the variance and skewness of so, uh, cloud water and vertical velocity. We can see the hatching is showing you where the um, what we've identified as uh, uh, the clouds to be. So um, these would be cloud free regions. These are cloudy regions. Uh, and just some takeaways here are that for the southern Great Plains, we see some of the strongest uh, vertical velocities. And this is what we would expect. Shallow cumulus are driven by these really strong, buoyant thermal updrafts. Okay, so um, first I'll show you some results for the clusterings, which will help us interpret the results of the machine learning models. So using the silhouette uh, analysis, which is basically some metric of um, separation and cohesion of the various clusters, we find that three clusters is the most informative. Um, and then we're doing these uh, k-means clusterings for various cloud scenes. So for each of the simulations through time, the, cloud, the given cloud scene is assigned a cluster. Um, we're starting at five hours here because we, the LES has some spin up time. Um, and we can see um, we are primarily looking at two clusters. And then for the Southern Ocean cases, there's a bit of a third cluster. I think it's interesting that the um, shallow cumulus cases aren't um, distinguished from some of the stratocumulus cases. Um, and then I think another thing you might ask when you're looking at these clusters is what's happening in the scenes where they switch from one cluster to another. So for the Northeast Pacific, we see some very light rain um, partway through the simulation um, co coinciding to that transition. But I think more importantly, we see a uh, a related uh, thinning of the cloud layer over time. Um, and then looking at uh, Southern Ocean case two, um, this is a stronger precipitating case, which the precipitation is building over the course of the simulation um, while the um, cloud water is relatively consistent through time. Um, we used a decision tree to interpret these clusters. Um, and I'll just kind of provide you with kind of the results of that. We can interpret cluster one as having low liquid water path skew and high liquid water path variability. Um, and so these are um, a lot of the closed cell cases. Um, we can see, um, so the, the various points highlighted here correspond to the, the plots and we're plotting liquid water path, a 2D field. Um, and so this class cluster one is dominated by the Northeast Pacific cases and some of um, the Eastern North Atlantic cases, as well as that later half of the Southern Ocean. Uh, the second cluster is defined by high liquid water path skew. Um, and so um, that's you have many low liquid water path values and then a tail of higher liquid water path, path values. Um, and I guess unsurprisingly, these are a lot of the shallow cumulus cases, uh, the open cell shadow cumulus cases as well. And then finally, um, we have low liquid water path skew and low liquid water path variability. Um, and so these are the Southern Ocean cases where we have pretty um, ubiquitous cloud cover. So um, now coming back to the three machine learning models, uh, I'll walk you through this plot and then we can kind of think about these results. So we have our various cases. So first we're looking for our three test cases um, across coarsening resolution. And then we have the various model types. So the blue line is the baseline. And then we have increasing levels of information about the subgrid scale. So um, here we're looking at cloud water. So we have information about cloud water variance uh, in orange, cloud water variance in skewness in green. And then finally, the information about the subgrid scale uh, organization in red. Um, and when I look at this, I am personally not convinced that subgrid scale spatial organization is 
uh, all that much more predictive than the subgrid scale variability on its own. I mean, I think though we can look at across these cases and kind of interpret what's going on here um, and see, I guess, like more broadly, what's the role of subgrid scale variability across these different regimes. So starting with, um, maybe we'll work this way across, starting with the um, Northeast Pacific case two, um, this is the case that uh, transitioned from cluster one to cluster two, um, but it is uh, defined by um, high cloud cover. We're looking at um, closed cell strata cumulus. And in that case, we have essentially most places a cloud fraction of one. And so our performance across the board is really high. This is not so hard of a prediction task. Of course, we do see some in uh, improvement when we provide the subgrid scale information um, and the latent variable uh, or the, the subgrid scale organization model is performing, for example, a bit better than the uh, just the variance model, but um, not a meaningful improvement. Then for our shallow cumulus case, we see um, this is a much harder task. So we have lower cloud fraction um, and that really drops off quickly. I think as we increase resolution, you are very quickly looking at uh, a, a mean field that includes both cloudy and cloud-free areas. Uh, and in this case, um, we see, especially at the coarsest resolution, that um, information about cloud water skewness is, uh, seems to be important. And then finally, for the Eastern North Atlantic winter one case, which is our open cell precipitating case, um, Performance doesn't drop off quite as quickly. This is again a lower cloud fraction case, so it's but not as as low as the Southern Great Plains shallow cumulus. So performance is dropping off, um, and we see having information to some subgrid scale information kind of uniformly improves uh, performance, but the organization again is not uh, outperforming. And then we also did the same uh, analysis using subgrid scale information about vertical velocity. Um, and in this case, for example, um, for the Southern Great Plains actually providing this subgrid scale information decreases performance across the board. Um, for the Eastern North Atlantic case, we see some improvement uh, at the coarsest resolution, although these are lower than what we saw when we provided information about cloud water. And then once again, for the uh, really high cloud coverage Northeast Pacific case, we see some improvement, but in this case, the subgrid scale organization for vertical velocity is now, I'd say below both the variance and skewness lines. Um, and so I guess, thinking about why this was a challenging task we were th we were looking at strata cumulus cases over the ocean and then some shallow cumulus over the land this is a relatively narrow region of the phase space for shallow clouds and in particular it might be one where subgrid scale organization for example is not so important so um in particular when we're looking at closed cell strata cumulus um not only subgrid scale organization, but subgrid scale variability doesn't seem to play that important of a role. Um, an area where uh, organization might be important for shallow clouds would be in the trades, where we can see more significant organization. So for those of you in the room familiar with this area, that might be things like the um, sugar, sugar, gravel, flour, uh, and fish type um, organization patterns. Uh, and then another thing is um, that we are looking at a 25 kilometer domain. Uh, for example, for strata cumulus cells, sometimes those organizational patterns can be larger than 25 kilometers. And actually, when we looked at the peak of the power spectra for doing our clustering analysis, for a significant portion of the cloud scenes, the peak was at our domain extent telling us that maybe these or, uh, spatial structures are larger than our domain, or at least we're not capturing them. Um, and then we could potentially have a bit of data imbalance. So training on closed cell strata cumulus cases might not be so informative for the shallow cumulus case. 
So um, as I said, this is ongoing work, but I wanted to leave you with some final thoughts. Um, I find that subgrid scale spatial information, um, particularly subgrid scale uh, uh, organization does not significantly improve our neural network based cloud fraction parameterization. Um, some subgrid scale variability in cloud water does improve prediction, um, but in uh, in some of the test cases, the subgrid scale variability in vertical velocity doesn't improve our cloud fraction prediction at all. Um, and then I, I, similar to the previous slide, we're left with the question of would in other regions of the shallow cloud phase space spatial organization be important? Um, we're not sure if that's a an outstanding question. Um, and yeah, that, that concludes my talk and thank you. Hi Maggie, thanks, really interesting talk. I'm wondering if you've thought about the implications of these um, non, or with the fact that these inputs are not so important to predicting cloud fraction, what does this say about all of those parameterizations for cloud fraction that you reviewed at the beginning that depend on these inputs? Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess one implication is, you know, building something that's based on means only is uh, perhaps the best we can do or based on this. Uh, but I guess there's also other cloud processes that are parameterized in general circulation models. So that might be a more rich area to try to include some subgrid skill information. Um, and it could also be that those cloud fraction parameterizations um, you know, for these types of shallow clouds um, do just fine, but for other uh, clouds, deepening clouds, or in other areas, they're, they're not sufficient. Thanks for a great talk, Maggie. Uh, uh, a question, maybe, uh, maybe it doesn't quite uh, matter, but have you looked at it in an autoregressive framework? So currently, it's a, as far as I understand, like it's a, it's a static problem, mm -hmm. or rather, it's time frame by time frame. Yeah. But there could be a case where subgrid organization, and like some, there's some memory in the system. That, yeah. that shows up at a later time scale. And there's some work about this. I'm not sure if this matters for cloud fraction as such. Yeah. Uh, but I wonder if you've looked at yeah. it. Yeah, it's something I've thought about. We haven't tested it, but I agree. I think that, uh, for, for example, if you're thinking about a transition from like a closed to open cell precipitation onset, perhaps subgrid scale uh, spatial information would be in, more informative there than some of these, yeah, static cases or just... Time. Yeah, and I think I was thinking mostly from precipitation, which is to say that I think Sarah found this, right? Like, yeah. it matters for precip, but precip is like just upstream of cloud fraction, mm -hmm. and maybe, or downstream, upstream, yeah. Like, so maybe if there's a precipitating case, there's a transition, and so there could be some memory in the system that yeah. might improve performance, but you know, it's just a thought. Yeah, no, I think it's, and I've had conversations with Sarah about this. Um, I, I think it's a really good point. Nice talk. Um, how well do the LES simulations compare to observations in terms of some of the metrics of organization and, and variability? Yeah. Um, so um, these, I guess for context, these simulations were run as part of the Eagles project where they're looking at aerosol cloud interactions. And I was looking at the base case, but they also have an aerosol having and doubling scenario. Um, my understanding is they agree reasonably well, but for example, in the like um, the like base aerosol case, in some cases they're not able to simulate precipitation. Um, I think they also particularly struggle to um, get open cell. Um, yeah, but uh, we can. I have. I've been talking a lot with Colleen about. Yeah, I guess the the um, fidelity of these LES um, and uh, can share some of those figures, but my understanding is it's reasonably well.
Thanks, Maggie. I have a couple of questions. One is that, um, do you have any explain why the prediction um, sort of scale decreases with length scale? Oh, sure. Yeah. So um, first, let me uh, provide context on how we define cloud fraction. So we use a cloud water cutoff um, of 0 0.001 grams per meter cubed. Um, and we're defining it that at the native 50 meter resolution. Uh, say we were to do that case, we are trying to predict cloud fraction at the 50 meter resolution. That's a trivial, trivial task for the neural network. It's essentially just learning our cutoff. And as we increase, uh, as we course in resolution, right, we're now averaging more and more cloud and cloud free regions. Um, so we have more variability it becomes a, a harder task. Yeah. The, the other one is so, you know, the, this is a very empirical kind of problem, right? You have to try many things, so many hyperparameters to tune. How do you decide that, like, the results that you've gotten are, like, how do you decide to stop versus just keep trying more hyperparameters, more inputs? Yeah. It's such a good question, and it's something that has been very challenging about this problem. In, in some ways, right, it's a relatively simple question, and then the model we're using to try to answer it is really complex. So there is some tuning. Um, I mean, those hyperparameters include like the size of the latent space, um, the activation for the output layer, all of, all of these things. Um, and I would say uh, I for several months tried to improve this prediction and tried to tune as much as I could. Um, and I think it's a really good question. At a certain point, it felt like, okay, I've, I've tried everything I can possibly think of. Perhaps this is as good as it gets. But to be able to reach that conclusion point in a more systematic way would be really useful. Um, and I think, you know, Maybe one thing we could do to try to do that is if we're going to use a more complex architecture to first apply it to a problem where we're pretty sure of the answer. I have one more. In some cases, the subgrid properties do actually make the prediction better. If you were to implement this in a atmospheric GCM or something, mm -hmm. Are those subgrid properties carried around? Like, where would you get them? Yeah, another great question. So, um, so this architecture was uh, largely inspired by Sarah's work, where she was using subgrid scale information to predict precipitation, uh, particularly the extremes. And my understanding is that follow-up work, she used some information about the previous time steps to then, as a as a proxy for this subgrid scale organization telling you something about how the, these systems evolve. So that would be one option um, for, yeah, but I guess I wouldn't say that these uh, architectures would be able to be plugged into a, a GCM. We don't have access to a lot of this subgrid scale information. It's more answering the question, is it important or not? And if it were to be important, then the next step would be, is there some proxy for this we could use? Thank you. And we do have a question online. The question is, did you include a comparison between ocean and land data simulation model results? Oh, um, so all of the stratocumulus cases, uh, the East North Atlantic, Northeastern Pacific and Southern Ocean are uh, marine uh, clouds, and then the uh, stratocumulus, or sorry, the shallow cumulus cases are over land. Um, and so I guess one thing we could do to compare ocean versus land performance would be to compare this test set to the other two. So this one is land, and these two are ocean. Do we have any other questions in the room or online? One last question. If not, that's all we have today. Thank you so much, Maggie.